Welcome to the Lazy Geeks Network. Captain, we are being hailed. This is Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise. Enterprise. But what could it be? Unknown, sir. Perhaps it is scanning. 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 Welcome to the Away Team podcast on the Lazy Geeks Network. Um, I know usually my good friend Steven, who is here, yeah. uh, does the intro, but he's about to die and shit. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm headlining this fucking thing. So if you don't like my accent, my attitude, my tone of voice, you might as well fuck off because you're not going to enjoy this podcast. Um <laughs> Obviously, a wait team podcast when we talk about Star Trek and the like. Finally, at the last episode of season one. Thank fucking God. Which is a um, childhood favorite of mine. <laughs> uh, this is one of the rare episodes, too, that had um, the secondary story and the main story felt the same. Like, they were weighted the same. They, they were, there wasn't, like, this little bullshit Wesley story on the <laughs> side or something right. like that. See, the only thing that this episode could have used is um, is a, uh, a, a, a traveler storyline. That's the only a traveler. Thing. Well, Wesley wasn't in this episode. So I know, but that's the only because he was the, in the traveler. He, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And there we go. <laughs> it's already started. See now. what what was probably spoken about like five seconds ago um, was sound and just back then. Looking back on those words may have actually kind of crossed the line somewhere. Look, I may have been a little rash. Okay. <laughs> Wesley may have a little rash too. <laughs> ooh, ooh. All right. So See, the way my there's... bank account works is <laughs> <laughs> way his bank account works. Um there's no there's no extra Star Trek news. Um go watch go watch the other the latest movie if you want. There's nothing Ain't nothing special going on. Um, okay, the one, sorry. The, the, it it with the going back to what we were talking about with this episode, like both stories did seem weighted the same, except it kind of felt like the the whole kind of Romulan introduction seemed kind of bigger than what it actually became to be. Well, it was supposed well, to, and and we have we have we some have behind the scenes. Yeah. We have some stuff and like it that, was but it supposed just, to be a much bigger thing. Right. But the thing was, is that this was setting up for everything. So most of those changes did, mostly didn't happen until after the fact, until the writer strike happened. But I don't know. I just kind of like, I know and we have this big mystery where thousands of people are dying and they never, it just, nothing happened. It, it just kind of falls off. It's kind of like that whole, um, last week's ep last time's episode with conspiracy, like the signal went out there. They really, a homie beacon. It kind of like felt that way too. Like another, yeah okay and i get why but it just looking back on it it feels really weird like okay you know i i get shit happens you know during productions of a television show so you know it, yeah but it was it this one in conspiracy the the um the disconnect is so fucking sloppy yeah. like to never go back to it and, and then, it's like and then only on. reference it in season two when you have you know that q episode right. But right. what, what strikes me as weird, and you, if you've never seen this episode before, which if you're listening to this podcast, I, I, I'm pretty sure you've seen this episode and you know pretty much about Star Trek history. I'm going to assume that. If not... Yes, I, ha I do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ha for those of you that haven't, read a book from time to time. Jesus. Right. Um, and get, get Netflix. Pay attention in history class. That's the problem. <laughs> That's really These the kids problem don't here. care about education. Anymore. I know. Shit. Um, but the thing is, is that when you're with this like looking at everything obviously you know uh, this is leading up to the this is supposed to be the first introduction of the borg and at this particular point that would show that the borg is in the alpha quadrant which we haven't we don't have alpha beta gamma quadrants yet 
in, in yeah. season one. But at this point, there's just space. <laughs> right, it's just the <laughs> space, the final frontier. Um, they didn't, they didn't have it all, all or the outer rim. Out. What was it? The outer rim or the outer? Right. The outer rim, as Picard said in Conspiracy. You know, they didn't have it all mapped out in the original series, did they? Uh, no, no. Same thing. No. Yeah, with the original series and with and with Earth, and we didn't even get Sector Zero Zero One until Best of Both Worlds. I think that's because as as we advance with our knowledge of space. I think the audience demands a little bit more <laughs> cohesion. Like, yeah. well, where the fuck are they? Right. <laughs> so, you know, but to, to the earlier point is that, you know, okay, we have, you know, that they were, you know, digging, scooping up these stations on the, on the Romulan and the, in the Federation side, which means that the Borg had already infiltrated Alpha Quadrant, the Alpha Quadrant at that point. But right. we never saw them until end of season three. So it's kind of like, well, and and the way they were introduced was, was far even, out. yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It was something because Q was being a dick. You know what I mean? Right. It wasn't. It wasn't like mapped out. It was completely random. Right, and then, that's what and, made it terrifying. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and in that episode, in that episode, um, when Q introduces them to the board, there's that point of like, well, then, and then I think Picard, and if I'm if I remember right, Picard says like, now they know where we exist. Like now right. they know we exist, which is like, well, wouldn't that they've known you exist before that? You know, so there was a there was a loose disconnect between linking this episode with the other one because this almost seems like an aberration, as opposed to, you know, actually going back and say, well, I mean, they reference like, well, the same, because was it best of both worlds where they actually mentioned this episode, like the same when they dug out the. Uh, that station on there before Shelby came on board. I think that was when they referenced the same thing. And then they referenced the other episode with that, but that was just kind of like a throwaway. They were just really loose leaf trying to connect things right. after the fact, because Maurice Hurley, who everyone hates, um, he wrote this one yeah, and he wasn't around in the later season, which you can totally tell too, that he was a total. Cause the writer. the, yeah, the tone changed. I yeah. mean, he was coming off of writing like cop dramas of the eighties, like the little action ec- yeah. equalizer, which was a good he, show. His those were those were both good shows, but his tone for this show was wrong. Like oh, yeah. he wanted everything to be run and gun, and and um, I was actually surprised that there there was such a uh, complexity to the whole Romulan exchange. Yeah, you know, I was surprised it just didn't end in fucking pew 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 yeah. with this motherfucker writing it, but whatever. Yeah, Picard um, leaning over to Riker going, fuck this shit, take him out. You know what, blow these motherfuckers. Oh, no, 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 you see you see them talking, and then all of a sudden in the background, Worf pops up behind them and stabs them both right on the view, on the view screen. <laughs> right. So, enough of this bullshitting around. Right. I'm, I'm running the show, okay? <laughs> Not really. I just, I'm just talking the most. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes shit. So we're going to start doing this right now. And I'm going to apologize in advance for the coughing because I've been fucking with this thing all fucking last two weeks. So I appreciate your apology. It really wasn't to you. It was to everybody listening. It should be to me because I have headphones on and it's ridiculous. Fuck Um, yourself. I I would if I wasn't doing this. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) As you made it clear before, you do suck your own dick. So, you know. I, you know what? I wish. Let's keep it honest. You know? <laughs> I know. Because, but uh, the, the thing is, is if we could, we never leave the house. So, right. You know, um, be done. <laughs> <laughs> fucking show's taking a really weird turn. <laughs> as they all do. Yeah. Um, Maurice Hurley had sometimes had something more in mind with this episode. The attack, the attacks the Romulans complain about in the neutral zone. The name of the show, by the way, um, dangled as an unresolved plot device for quite some time. We just talked about this, but there was a plan. Hurley had meant for this episode to comprise part of a trilogy in which the Borg would be formally introduced. The opening episode of the second season further explains matters, explored matters, uh, including a possible alliance between the Federation and the Romulan Empire. It's the Romulan Star Empire. Right. You know, just saying, guys, uh, to counter the new threat. Such plans, however, were ruined by the 1988 Writers Guild of America strike. As such, the Borgs 
introduction had to wait until Q who, which is still, I mean, and as we said, it was still a cool introduction. Yeah. But I think it would have been, I think, I think it would have been cool, but it's almost weird to think of an alliance between the Romulans and the Federation. I mean, I kind of knowing the way best of both worlds worked out. I'm kind of glad it was so delayed because the character development by that point, I thought it was a lot stronger. That yeah. would have changed the whole dynamic of the entire series, too. Oh, yeah. Because the Romulans were antagonists a lot. Yeah. You know, and if we were buddying up with them so early on, mm-hmm. it would have made them more of a, I don't know. Silence your dog. Ooh, that was cold blooded. I was like, this motherfucker about to catch these hands, cold dude. Blooded. <laughs> cold blooded. You know, Picard never has anyone's back. He's like, he said his question was valid, but he should, right. he should, I, if I was a captain, but like, hey, Watch that fucking tone of voice, right? Yeah. But he's also um, <laughs> he was smarter about it. <laughs> I would have got the ship blown up. Right. So the premise of this episode shares some similarities to the original series Space Seed, as it features the Enterprise encountering an ancient derelict spacecraft with cryogenically frozen humans from Earth in the 1990s, and then reviving the occupants whose chambers had not failed. Of course, these occupants proved to be much easier for the to, crew to deal with, relatively speaking, than Khan, Nui, and Singh. Ooh. <laughs> I never saw that episode. I might have to go back and watch that. It's a cool episode. I mean, it's a cool episode. It's the 60s, but it's Ricardo I need to go Mont- back and watch it. It's Ricardo Montalban. I mean, you know. Done and done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. A young Ricardo Montalban. Exactly. I mean, I looked at him. I mean, I, it was funny because I think it was, they were having a, BBC America does the original Star Trek marathon like on Friday nights. So they break the week up of showing reruns of Star Trek Next Generation all the time to actually show the original series on Friday nights. And um, I was watching, and I go, oh, Space Seed. And then I saw Ricardo Montalban and tanned and the long hair, and I was like, I'm kind of feeling a little weird right now. <laughs> felt some kind of way. Yeah, I was feeling some kind of way, and I was like, mm, damn. <laughs> Look, I ain't gay, but if I was, <laughs> I'd be, his dick be in my mouth. That's all I'm trying to say. Like, God damn. See, I'm a, you know, I may not be gay, but I took his dick. That's just what it's coming down to. <laughs> the opening credits include Denise Crosby's character, Natasha Yad, despite her death in a evil three episodes earlier. This is the last episode to credit her as a regular. That's because all these fucking episodes are out of sequence. Well, not only that, it's because it would have cost them more money to delete the name. So yeah. it was like, we'll just, just do it for the second season. Do it. We'll just do it for the second season. Because we're going to have to put in a new doctor anyway, so we might as well cut her and then put the uh... doctor in there. That was the shittiest fuck. That, that almost felt like too. It's like okay, we'll get you to we'll get rid of Yah for you. Oh, thanks. But we're taking Crusher too. Hey, what the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I was watching one of the second seasons, and I was like, oh, God, we got to go through that. Yeah. Uh, but Will Wheaton. Yeah, I know. Will Wheaton, Wesley Crusher, does not appear in this episode. However, the screenplay featured Wesley, and it was he who replicated a guitar for Sonny Clement. In the scene scripted but not filmed, Sonny asked him about several genres of popular music, including rock and roll and rhythm and blues. But despite being a teenager, Wesley does ha- doesn't have a clue about them. Star Trek The Next Generation Companion, a series guide and script library. And I think at that point, we, we, we got it. They were, they were out of touch. Right. You know, I kind of like how they played it, though. Since the show is set in the future, it seemed like the crew was out of touch. Yeah. Not those three people. Right. <laughs> totally. Um. This episode marks um, Mark Al- Alamo, right? Alamo's yeah. uh, second time on Star Trek. He previously appeared as Badar Inindid in Lonely Among Us and will go on to portray uh, Frederick Le- La Ro- Rourke in Time's Arrow and, of course, Gould Dugat in Star Trek Deep Space I love Nine. Him as Gould Dugat. I mean, that motherfucker's all over Star Trek. Oh, yeah. And you know what's funny, though, is that I've met this guy in real life. And oh yeah, you were telling me. And the thing is, is that he doesn't look that much different from the makeup. It's kind of, eh. it's, it's it's one of he those. He looks like a Kardashian, like straight <laughs> up. <laughs> I know. I looked and I was like, oh shit, that's him. Even without like the raised neckline and stuff. And I'm like, that's oh. all it is. I mean, if you think about most Star Trek races, their forehead's different, and their neck, and then there's little accents somewhere, but it's right. not too much off. Yeah. You know. When Deanna Troy is conferring with Claire Raymond concerning her family tree during this episode, 
the desktop monitor on Troy's desk displays a list of the first six actors who starred as do the Doctor in Doctor Who, as well as television characters Mary Richards, Lou Grant, Kermit T. Frog, and Miss Piggy, among others. In the remastered version, most of the names were replaced with names of TNG actors, production staff, and the staff from CBS Digital and CBS Television Distribution. I think that's bullshit. I don't know why they changed it. I know. That would have been cool to Keep see. Keep that it. shit legit. Little Doctor, little doctor, doctor Who throwaway and shit. Hey, now we found the link. Now we found the link. Because remember in um, Conspiracy, they used that star chart in, do in that uh, Sarah Jane Adventures, which is Doctor Who spinoff. Mm -hmm. Now the link. They used doc the doctor, the actor's name. It's all connected, man. It's all one giant cinematic universe. <laughs> well, Doctor Who transcends all universe. He can go to any universe you want. This is true. So, I mean, whatever. He's above it all. <laughs> you know. Additionally, a Constitution class starship model is seen there near Claire uh, in the guest quarters. However, the nacelles of the model are attached perpendicular to their standard position and backwards. That sounds like somebody fucking up in the prop department. Yeah. Like, just throw this in there. I don't. <laughs> you know, see, I would normally care. But like I'm not, I'm not coming back next season. So fuck y'all. <laughs> pretty much. My wife I'm... is one of them writers, motherfucker. I'm sick of this shit. Nah. This episode marks the only time the Romulan uniform is seen with a black slash over the shoulder. I didn't even really notice. Either. Um, the glass-shaped pyramid appears in this episode as a decoration with flowers inside, in the oh. guest quarters of LQ Lemons. It was previously seen in James T. Kirk's apartment in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and Tasha Yaw's quarters in TNG, The Naked Now, uh, in the guest quarters of the Antikins in TNG, Lonely Among Us, and in Café de, Café des Artis, Artis, in TNG, We'll Always Have the Harris. Yeah, uh, I mean, at this point, like when we mentioned in the season, in the last episode, too, when you get towards the end of the season, you're going to start seeing a lot of recycled shit. Yeah, because the the budget's over now. They're, right. They're, they've already spent it on all the other episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, um, the paintings. Oh wait, that's not it. Oh no, that is it. Yeah, it is. The painting yeah. scene in. L.Q. Clemens' guest quarters previously appeared previously in the episode Symbiosis and will be featured in several, several season two episodes. This episode marks the only appearance of the painting missing the planet next to the sun. Some people are on these details with these fucking paintings. There's like, there's like a painting thing in every show. Well, you know, I mean, there's some people that have lives like us and others that don't, which write these. Right. Yeah, we only... <laughs> run and operate a podcast right uh specifically for star trek right but yeah we have lives <laughs> i mean what what would i be doing if i wasn't doing this playing uh fucking city skyline <laughs> i was just gonna say that <laughs> that's all i've been doing um <laughs> the cryonic satellite was identified only as an ancient capsule or space module in the episode both the star trek encyclopedia and star trek the next generation companion mentions that the name SS Bird Eye, Bird's Eye uh, was inscribed in the hull. The topmost segment of the satellite was labeled with the registry or identification number 4077, one of the many references to MASH. MASH was a dope show, dude. Oh, yeah. This I used to watch reruns of that every night because they used oh, to yeah. play it at Nick and Night, I think. Yeah, I remember when I, um, what was it? Like I would come home from school and like this was like, just after it ended, it was playing on like channel 11 at like 5 and 5.30. So like I'd come home from school and then I'd turn on TV and MASH would be on. And then that I show would... kind of fucked me. That show kind of fucked me up because I was young. Yeah. And like I'd watch it. I thought it was funny. You know, the guy, um, I forget all the names, but the, the doctor who was always trying to get a drink and he was yeah. always goofing around. Like I love that dude. But then like shit would get real serious because they're in war. Right. You know, and I'm just like, fuck, like this is crazy. Yeah. And I'd sit there and go like, fuck with this war shit. Just give me the funny stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we have to play poker or something? Right, exactly. Like, where's Radar at? <laughs> I want to see you hook up with that other chick. Let's go. Come on. Let's do this. Right. This episode marks the first time a specific year is mentioned in relation to the setting of the Star Trek series. When Data cites the current year as 2364, this year served as a fixed reference around with um, which subsequent timeline Data was placed. Prior to this, Star Trek The Next Generation is generally placed in the early 24th century per data's line in Encounter at Farpoint. 
where he's establishing that he was from the class of 78. Class 78, motherfucker. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool. You know, this, this episode, that makes this episode pretty damn important because it's the baseline for the star dates. <laughs> right. You know, so that's kind of cool. Um, the episode also mocks the first appearance of the Der- Deridex class. I'm pretty sure it's D Deridex uh, class warbird. Uh, which is seen numerous times throughout the series as well as in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Star Trek Voyager. And can I say, one of the most elegant fucking starship designs. Because you know what it is? It looks sexy, but it looks threatening too. Yeah. You know, like it looks like, it's like, oh, that's pretty, but it's going to fuck me up. Like, (laughs) (laughs) it's just such a, and it was, if you really look at the other ships, it's very unique. Oh yeah, you know, and not not just the Romulan ships because the majority of the Romulan ships are just Klingon ships, which there is history behind that. Yeah. Um, but if it's history about the future, is it post history? <laughs> right. Is it, if it's about the future, is it still considered history? Let's ask Barry Allen about that and find out. What this <laughs> right. Is. And they don't fuck it up. Yeah. Um, like You're getting all the long ones. I know, right? <laughs> Like the Naked Now's reference to the USSR earlier in the season, the episode contained a historical prediction that would be proven inaccurate within a few years. While at the time the episode was made, Sam Sonny Clement believed that his beloved Atlanta Braves are probably still finding ways to lose was an accurate reflection of their performance by the time in the mid nineties today. In the mid nineties, um, that they were cry- um, the cryonic satellites would have been launched. The Braves were in the middle of their 15-year run in which they were consistently one of the premier teams in Major League Baseball, winning the World Series in 1995, defeating the Cleveland Indians, who had summarily misrepresented the big goodbye when Dixon Hill Dixon Hill vendor thought Data was nuts when he mentioned that the Indians would stop Joe DiMaggio's hitting streak. They were as bad as the Braves in 1988, but they had been one of the better teams in the American League at the time of the Hollow novels takes place. However, while the Braves won 14 straight division titles between 1991 and 2005, 1995 was the only championship in that span, finding ways to lose in other years. <laughs> Poor Brave. Yeah. This is the first the episode in which chop bullshit. Right. The, yeah, they're the only time you see them on the news now is because <laughs> people are saying they're racist. Um. <laughs> This is the first episode in which the Borg are mentioned, although they are at this point only an unknown entity which has been destroying star bases. Yeah. Does it even say, or just as an unknown entity, I guess? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, This episode is the only one in Star Trek, in Star Trek referencing the Borgs attacking the Romulans in Voyager Unity. Commander Chakotay of the Starship USS Voyager encounters. Um, liberating Borg drones in the Delta Quadrant nearly a decade later. Among them was a former drone named Kurum, who identified himself as Romulan. Mm. Yeah, if you you pay attention, you get a lot of throwbacks. Yeah. If you know what you're looking for, you know. Right. Um, Worf mentions the Romulans have killed his parents during the attack on Kittimer, which, trust me, if you watch TNG, you know. Right. (laughs) He mentions it a lot. When they were supposed to be our allies, however, reunion, however, reunion later established the Klingons and Romulans had been blood enemies uh, for decades before that. I don't know. Maybe there was like a loose little like, oh, we're going to be friends now because the Romulans are known for that shit. They'll right. they'll lie they'll through their fucking yeah. teeth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and if you watch Star Trek, you know that too because the Romulans sided with the Dominion when they right. were invading um, Federation and Klingon space. But because they don't they. The Romulans have always wanted to knock the Federation off the board. Right. So they'll, they'll go with whoever is against the Federation. Yeah, so the Cardassians and the Romulans sided with the Dominion, while the Klingons and everybody else sided with the Federation. Right. Um, some epic space battles ensued. Oh, man. Those are some great ones. Uh, Despite a glee fans felt over the return of the Romulans, there were concurrently a sense of unease at the time over some uncharacteristic statements uttered by the principal characters which they felt flew in the face of the spirit of star trek these included let me read this one this one's long as fuck and i was talking about um we were talking about this before the show so this this is two and it's funny because i was i was thinking about these two exact lines yeah and then i saw this in the show notes i was like oh it's not just me 
So scene two, and this is a quote, it's just a piece of space debris. If we weren't sitting here waiting for the captain, we wouldn't have even noticed it. Leave it be, let nature take its course. So Riker, contradicting the exploratory right. nature of the mission, uh, especially from a period of time in Earth's history, which had been established as somewhat mirrored. What does that mean again? Was it? Oh, oh mired? Mired, yeah. Well, what's funny is that in a couple of episodes before, they were on okay. their way to, um, to um, I can't remember, They were. I think they were on shore leave or something like that, and then this little something happened over here, so they diverted course to go check it out. It's like, well, th that that doesn't make sense then. Like, I don't, I don't, yeah, because, like, I'm like, you guys get off on this stuff. Like, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> yeah, so that was weird. And then um, the second one was scene 23. But Data, they were already dead. I mean, what more could have happened to them? They are alive now, so we have to treat them as living human beings. Uh, Picard contradicting himself as apparently they were not dead and expressing a willingness to have left them without even trying to revive them, as well as showcasing bigotry in the closing. I don't see bigotry in the closing remarks. I think that's a little heavy handed. But um, yeah, that's that was that was the worst one. I was yeah. like, the captain would never yeah. say that. Yeah, I know. Like, that I, was ridiculous. When I heard that, I was like, wow, Data has more of a moral code than Picard. Like, come on. Like, I get what they were trying to say, like, he's busy with the Romulan thing. I get it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, he, and he probably, and out of everyone on that ship, Captain would have been most upset if they didn't go check that thing out. Right. And, like, what do you and, mean? You were waiting. You might as well go check it out. And the thing was, is like, you know, with that, and that Picard didn't even know that data had brought those things over i'm like i think Riker probably would have said something right away yeah because the first thing that happens when he gets on the ship is Riker gives him a rundown of what happened when he's gone right so and that was a pretty big piece of it yeah and then oh all, yeah we found some cryogenically frozen a, people yeah and then it's like data did i didn't know about this it's like must must have forgot to put it in his report yeah like oh you know see that was the part that i was telling you it kind of had that glazed look over your face when i kind of noticed you weren't paying attention anymore and then I said, um, and uh, Worf and I ran a train on Beverly, and you didn't seem to notice. So, right. you know. Dementia is a weird thing. <laughs> it's like shit. While writer Hurley could have been faulted for this due to the fact that he was only recently hired, not having any experience with sci -fi science fiction, Star Trek in particular whatsoever, it was only partially true. As already indicated by Conway above, most... Uh, most responsible was the writer's strike that intervened and provided little time and opportunity to revise the story outline originally submitted into the teleplay, which Hurley had to do on the fly in one and a half days. Yeah, so you kind of got to give him a break on that. Like, he's coming off of, like I said, the cop shows where it's real fast fire, you know, and, and everyone's kind of like, fuck that, I got shit to do. Right. You know what I mean? And, and sci-fi is a completely different beast you have to worry about. I feel like character development's much more important in fantasy and um, science fiction. Like it's much more heavy. Like you really, if it's just an action show where they're blowing shit up every week, they, you don't really have to. They're just going to be an archetype of a hero in some way. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. You know? All right, motherfuckers, let's let's do this shit. <laughs> Starting off. Okay, Daddy, read us a story. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> um. First office's log, Friday, 41986.0. We are awaiting the return of Captain Picard, who was summoned to Starbase 718. Meanwhile, our senses have been monitoring an ancient capsule floating in our vicinity, which appears to be from Earth. Right there, that's what pisses me off. Like, it appears from from Earth, and you don't give a fuck. Right, I know. You, you think like, oh, that. we've been out here a long time. Yeah, like, yeah. it's whatever. And even Worf was like, um, he said, we can move it with the tractor beam so it doesn't fly into the star that's coming up. He's like, who cares? Yeah. Like, for it, real, dude? It, it, it really was like the last day before vacation kind of feel. Like, it's ridiculous. you know, and then they're like, yeah, we're just chilling, waiting for Picard, but. It's Friday. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Right. About to kick out. Like, yeah, I, I got time. And it's like, it's just junk. Don't stress about it, Worf. It's just junk. Right. Don't worry about it. Someone will clean it up. Don't worry. Right. Whatever. Um, the USS Enterprise D, these nuts, encounters a ship carrying cryogenically frozen humans from the late 20th century during a critical mission into the Romulan neutral zone to solve a mystery concerning a string of destroyed Federation outposts. Uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard 
is attending an emergency conference on Star Base 718 while the bridge crew is observing an ancient space capsule, apparently from Earth. Data requests permission from Commander Riker to board the vi- vehicle while waiting for the captain's return. Riker grants him permission, but wants him back aboard the Enterprise D yeah, before, before Picard returns. I know. I was like the specific, like when Captain Picard is like, "We, we're gonna." It's like Dad. Yeah, it's all, we're waiting it's all, for Dad. Right. You better be in the car Dad's before Dad home. comes. Before yeah. Dad gets there. Well, first of all, they leave all this shit out. The summary is that they don't give a fuck. Like only Data gives a fuck. Right, and it's just so weird that like Data's all up about it. And everybody in Worf too, like it's the non-humans that that are like. Um, oh yeah, Worf was kind of intrigued too. Wasn't yeah, it was he? like you know I can I can pull a tractor beam on it, or you know we can, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can I can actually do my job, but you guys don't seem to want to do that. So like it will literally take me two seconds. Mm-hmm. I can move it. You know, no, it's fine. Yeah, I don't like, want you, I don't want you to hurt your finger. You know, to to activate the tractor beam. So don't worry about it. Here's another thing they never explain though. It's a so this thing is a cryogenically. A cryogenic facility in space. They explain later why it's in space, but <laughs> why is it way out here? Wouldn't it just be an orbit that's around what, Earth? Well, that's what they mentioned later on, that it's supposed to be in orbit so it doesn't suffer from power failure. So how the fuck did it get out there? Like, nobody bothered to even check on it, like, what happened? You know, like, oh, it's so long ago. Fuck it. You know, it's fuck like... Fuck it. Yeah, I'm it, like, whatever. It's like, what What did it... Did, like, everything get deleted with the last hardware update? I don't, I don't <laughs> understand why... I mean... You know, what is everything Apple over there where they they forget about their whole previous thing? Right. You know? The cryogenic facility version six has already been out. Like we don't even <laughs> give a fuck about this one. If you notice on the on the glass of each of the cryo tubes, there is a little Apple logo. Just right. Say it. Just say it. Right. <laughs> but they didn't. Yeah, but, not, they, but they didn't acknowledge that anything was wrong. Then they wouldn't be able to plug anything into it. Oh uh, yeah. Well, yeah, if, so. if, in, in the extended cut, you actually see a bunch of dongles. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, if it's run by Apple, the episode would be fucking three hours <laughs> like, trying to get it to do anything. Seriously. Um, Data and Wolf beam aboard uh, the capsule and explain or examine, I'm sorry, the old style equipment. Wolf is momentarily baffled by a door that must be manually opened. For real? Wolf can't figure out a doorknob. Well, like, funny. I think that was a little, that was a little much. Or, dude. You know, well, it was to me, it was like, we really data showing off there, like, oh, I got this. Yeah, you let know. me open the door for you. Oh, right. Jesus. Yeah, I know. I was Upon like, it. I was like, really, dude? I go, this is just a little bit of a data showing off here. <laughs> Upon entering the vessel's main chamber, the two discover a number of refrigeration pods. The seal on two of them has have been broken, and the environment corrupted. These two contain the these two contain decomposed human remains. Three pods contain frozen humans. There's also they're not mentioning there's one pod that was empty yeah um which i find weird like why would you launch a ship with one empty pod yeah um did he leave <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know part way through that's how they ended up out there the guy was like fuck this shit and started like <laughs> we yeah. going on a trip motherfucker. we're exactly. we going on a journey and then you know suddenly he was like oh, rocket man the whole time <laughs> <laughs> but what's funny is that the camera like when the teaser ends, like it does that four shot because they found the woman. It was like, yeah. really? Like, Wait. Lieutenant, there's a hot chick in here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're going to want to see this. <laughs> yeah. uh, Commander, Dave, Lieutenant, Commander, there's a hot chick in here. She's frozen. <laughs> it might feel weird, but you think I might um, have a little little time? Hey, um, is it possible to just thaw out one particular region of a body? I'm asking for a friend. Because <laughs> I wouldn't, because that would be un- dishonorable. But I have right, a buddy right. back on the ship that would might be a But don't judge me. It just gets this big thing. <laughs> so we roll right into Act 1. Um, when Data is ordered back to the Enterprise D, and he was ordered back. Hurry up, the captain's here. Dad's home. Dad's home, you need to get back in here pronto. (laughs) In preparation for Picard's return, (laughs) he requests that the frozen people also be brought aboard as the capsule is seriously damaged. Upon Picard's return, and this is another time, too, where where everyone's kind of like, ugh, okay, like, whatever. It's weird. One of the things that surprised me, though, was the fact that they didn't even, I mean, I get it, you got shit to do, but... I mean, it's a probe. It's probably not. It. I mean, the D Enterprise D is probably bigger than that. So, wouldn't you have like brought it into a shuttle bay or something? Like, I guess it's not necessary. I mean, they've done it before with other shit. 
like loaded into the shuttle bay. This had humans on there. Let's see where this came from. No, we don't got time for that. We got Romulans. Fuck these people. I don't know. We have we don't know how big it is because um we didn't see it like next to the Enterprise, but I'm pretty sure it's not that big. It looked pretty yeah. cramped. Yeah. Yeah. Upon Picard's return, he immediately orders helmsman Geordi LaForge to lay in a course that will take them into the neutral zone. He explains to the senior officers in the observation lounge that several outposts have been destroyed and the Enterprise D is being sent as the only Federation vessel to investigate as as it is the flagship. What's funny, so, what's funny in that, and it was the, um, like he gives the course heading and Geordi's like, um, that's going to take us into the neutral zone. And Picard gave that look of like, did I fucking stutter? Yeah, like I know where we're going, bitch. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, um, oh! Did you Google Maps? See, I was wazing it, and um, it, it told me to go there. Were you using Google Maps, bitch? He slam his head against the console. <laughs> I was using Bing, bro. <laughs> I told you stop using. I, still, I, still, I told you stop using MapQuest. I stay with MapQuest. <laughs> it's still good. Ride or die, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> It is assumed that the Romulans have been having the problems, but since the Federation has had no contact with them in a number of years since the tomed incident, um, I hate the... when they mention fucking and they mention events and give you nothing. I know. I hate well, that. Memory Alpha does here. Hold on. The tomed incident. It's like, like it, it's like uh, the best joke was that um, in um, uh, Dodgeball when. Um, you know the uh, they're in the finals, and and Michael Cole's like, this reminds me of the Helsinki incident in 1918, and we all know how that turned out. You know, it's like, no, but the tomed incident, the tomed incident is a big thing though. They've talked about it in a couple different episodes. So here, I will, I will bestow some knowledge. The tomed incident was a terrible confrontation between the United Federation of Planets and the Romulan Star mm-hmm. Empire in 2311. It cost thousands of lives. The incident led to the signing of the Treaty of Algaron, which I'm sure you know about the Treaty of Algaron. Who does? Okay. Which banned Federation research into or use of any cloaking device. Which and I led to the withdrawal. Bullshit. Which I always thought was bullshit. Oh, yeah, the Romulans can have it, but the Federation can't. It, there was a reason, though. It's a trade-off. And led to the withdrawal of the Romulan government from interstellar affairs in, until 2364. So they can't use the cloaking device... But the Romulans will get out of everybody's fucking business for a while. Until what year? 2364. What year is it in this show? 2364. We're back. It all makes sense now. They actually thought that out. Um, (laughs) uh, The situation is very uncertain. Riker and Worf both advised the captain to be prepared to fight. Worf and Riker were about to throw hands. This whole episode they wanted to throw down. Like it was, Worf is usually the one that does that, but Riker was, I don't know, man. He forgot to take his vitamins or something. He wanted to kick somebody's ass. Yeah. But he is determined to wait and see what the situation truly is before deciding on an aggressive course of action. Meanwhile, Doctor Crusher has thawed well, be- and revived. Before before we move into that, um, there was a part where Picard asked Troy to give him all the information about the Romulans. And I had thought that it was awesome that she had already kind of showed her unimportance in the series by saying, you know, there's very little information about them. Like, I'm already useless in this. And now you're giving me something that's going to be even more useless. Thank you. You know what? Me. I'm going to kind of I'm going to kind of disagree with you, though, because I feel Troy pulled some weight this episode. Like she gave the she gave the assessment of how they react to things which guided his hand. That they're reactionary. Like they wait for you to do the first thing and then they do it, which caused Picard not to be red alert all the fucking time, guns blazing. And he oh, helped he that broad find uh, <laughs> And he helped that broad find her family. She did some shit. She did some sh- some shrink shit, you know. <laughs> Give us some credit, fuck. <laughs> and that cleavage, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> Meanwhile, Dr. Crusher has thought and revived the frozen humans. All three had been cryogenically frozen in the late 20th century. And they were all frozen after they died. Yes. Dr. Crusher awakens the woman who promptly faints at the sight of war. Uh, Welcome to the 24th century, Picard remarks to her while she lies unconscious. And the fact that he had that smile on his face like she fainted at it was kind of like he just took a little sadistic pleasure in this episode, it seemed. 
Like, there were, I mean, the fact that Data had more of a moral code than Picard in this one was a little weird. But the thing... It's only really in the first act, though. Yeah, and then, you know, like, she sees Worf and then she faints. And I was like, I wrote down, Worf makes all the girls faint, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, when he flops that dick out. Yeah, he has to unravel yeah. it. <laughs> That's right. Um, That's when the ship shudders. I'm checking my notes to see if I have anything funny to say, and I don't. So, <laughs> rolling right into Act Two, the humans are Claire, Claire Raymond, Ralph Offenhouse, such a such a fucking Manhattan upper crust name, yeah. you know what I mean? And LQ Sonny Clemens, <laughs> this motherfucker's my spirit animal. Dude, I love to do this episode <laughs> as the ship continues <laughs> towards the neutral zone. Neutral zone. Riker explains to them. What has happened? And they the neutral they zone attempt or the danger zone. Oh, they're always in the danger zone. <laughs> and they attempt to make sense of their new situation. Often, House in particular is shocked to learn from Data that the current year is twenty three sixty four. Often, House is very concerned about his financial investments and repeatedly demands to speak to the captain so he can get in touch with his attorney or bank on Earth. I love how they. they it's what nineteen eighty eight. 1989 in real world time well, and they don't even they don't even give a shit that they're in space yeah like like you know none of them well i mean obviously the 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 clement guy is just like all about whatever dude um, he's just like let's do what we do you, you know? know and the other guy is like all about yeah all about his money and it's just like okay i kind of get it 80s self-indulgent but at the same time it's like you're all in fucking space like how the fuck? Like, enjoy that for a second. But the thing you know is, what is I mean? The like, questions should more be like, instead of them, um, how did we get out here? You know, but right. all the guy kept saying was like, oh, I'm sure my stock split 50 times since, you know, since that's like. And I think that's part of the gag, too, is that he he's in the 20th century. We only cared about money. And I'm like, in a sense. <laughs> but I, I think if you, even if you got Donald Trump's ass up there in the fucking spaceship, he'd be like, where the fuck are we? Like, uh, what got us to this point? We're out here in space. I'm going to make space great again. He's going to build a wall on the uh, neutral zone. Exactly, to keep the Romulans <laughs> on their side. <laughs> well, what's funny, though, is that, like, you know, after Picard went back to the bridge, he tells Riker, you're dealing with the old people. Keep them out of my way. Like, Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. And he gave him that serious look, too. I was expecting him to be funny. like, for real? <laughs> oh, one thing they didn't mention in this, uh, let's go, let's, let's, rewind a little bit to act one um they didn't mention what <laughs> these three people had wrong with them um oh, right. the woman died of a aneurysm an aneurysm um so it was very sudden she was healthy and then just pop um the businessman often house he had a hot problem um and clemens or yeah sunny he um basically heavy heavy living like drinking yeah. his body was all what deteriorated was liver was failing too afraid to live too afraid to die yeah yeah too afraid to die but too scared to live oh, or yeah. something like yeah, that something like that it was pretty legit though and it's kind of true because a lot of people do that like yeah. we were talking about that off uh before the podcast if people like are severe drug addicts because they're they're a lot of them are just scared of life yeah you know and it's it's sad but let's not get too uh existential Which is what i do all the time you know oh <laughs> anyway anyways, anyways. <laughs> um where the fuck was i uh okay oh we're in act three now i guess that's all that happened in act two um, we met the the old people what else happened i know some um, more shit yes um well like uh it was funny because like they explained what had happened why well, I, I put a note here that they just explained everything that happened but then the woman needs everything to be explained again. I just, I always hate that in drama. Like they explain everything. Like, wait, I, what happened? Tell me what happened. It's like they just spent t five minutes telling you. Oh, what happened. but they were so heavy with it too. Like, like they explained everything, and then she goes, "Can someone tell me what's going on?" Yeah, and I'm like, they, they just fucking did. Yeah, like, what's the matter with you? I know, right. Um, you know, and I know I get it. It's to explain it to the audience, but there's more clever ways to do yeah. that. What I thought was hilarious, though, was um, Clemens' uh, line of like, you know, when they were talking about that being a racket or whatever, and he's like, well, "I figured, why well, get? I'll give them the money instead of to my ex-wife." Yeah, I was like, <laughs> right on. <laughs> that was. I awesome. even quote. I even quoted it when Data was leaving. 
<laughs> Sonny Sonny took a Sonny Cummins took a, a liking to Data. Yeah, he did. It's it's not really explained why he he just did. Um, I think it's because Data's the only one that wasn't really judging. Yeah. He, he Data wasn't annoyed by them being there. Everyone else was annoyed. Um, he he told David, which maybe con- later which we can find consistent in the first season. <laughs> yeah. He said, he said, he said, maybe later we could find some low mileage pit wolfies and help them build a memory. I was like, what oh my the, God. I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, I'm totally at a loss. <laughs> it means some young, some young woman, some young women to fuck. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I've never heard that like phrase before. I was like, what the fuck? Injecting some Southern curriculums. <laughs> What was funny yeah. too was like he was like uh, you know the TV he was asking about TV, and it's like oh yeah oh yeah that form of that form of entertainment died out in 2040. And it's was, funny how they were knocking TV on a TV show. Oh yeah, I thought that was good. But what's funny is like I'm like well 2016 a lot of people are cable cutting. Yeah, I can see it. You know what's funny? Yeah, it's completely true. Yeah, like you can see the slow de- decline of the of how television was in the 80s and the 90s. Right. You know, it still exists. It's still going to exist, but in a different format. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it all because really, at the end of the day, all a television show is is a play. Yeah. It's you know, and that's never going to die. Storytelling is never going to die. When and that it, dies, we're dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Riker and uh, Data are walking down the hall, and you know, he was like, you know, I he goes, I look at them and I wonder how we survived the 21st century. And then I was like, yeah, I'm still wondering that myself. Fuck. Yeah. You there? Now. Hello. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. You keep fading in and out. No, you're fading in and out. I can hear you. You're fading in and out anyway. Um <laughs> the where the fuck are we now? Oh <laughs> Jesus Christ. Act three. Act three. This is hard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um after I don't observing... need to know your current status, okay? <laughs> right. After observing Riker <laughs> use the room's comm panel, often house calls Picard, interrupting a meeting in the ready room with the offices involving the upcoming Romulan situation. This forces Picard to visit the survivors. Picard's a smooth pimp, too. This dude's still yelling on the comm. Picard just busts in the room like, what's good, motherfucker? Like, what, what I, do you need? What I thought was funny was before that when he's like, what's a QE2? And then he's like, he's comparing the Enterprise to a cruise ship. That was funny. That was. <laughs> um, I keep losing my place. Um, Often now seizes the opportunity for a face-to-face talk with the captain, demanding contact with his attorney. But the captain tells him that money uh, has become obsolete in this century and his attorney has been dead for 400 years. Often now stands firm, stating that humanity must still be as it once was, power-hungry and controlling. Uh, Picard retorts that humans no longer seek such material things. They have grown out of their infancy. This is also a line from uh, Offenhouse that that was pretty good too, where he said it was never about the collection of material things. It was about power, yeah. which is very true. Yeah, it's it's not really about money yeah, or how many yeah. cars. It it gives you power over people when you when you have those things. That stuff is trinkets. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just proof that you have power. That's all it is. Yeah, you know. It's what, that's why people will fucking spend by the nicest car possible, but they live in a shack because yeah. no one's looking at your house. They're looking <laughs> at your car. Right. I'm the opposite, though. I'll drive a fucking hoopty and I'll roll up to the comfy spot. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, they're really fucking passing by a lot of shit in this. Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there is kind of, you know, how, how do you say? Um quick to kind of go over you know yeah kind of filler shit yeah i mean you know but the one thing they didn't they didn't mention in act three is there's nine star bases where they're going and they can't get a hold of any of them yeah it's a pretty serious threat and the fact of the matter is they're only sending one starship you know it's kind of like well it's like right well see we don't know exactly what's going on so let's just send one ship because if that ship gets destroyed then we can send the rest right you know um, <laughs> the Enterprise is the Marines. Right, exactly. <laughs> but what was funny is the fact that, you know, like, you know, Riker and Worf and everybody's assuming the Romulans are on the warpath. Um, 
And it kind of surprises me that they would not have any knowledge that the same thing happened to their bases. Right. You know, because it's like, come on, guys. We know you have information that was a, That was the thing. And, and you can definitely tell that, um, what's his name? The writer. Early. Really did, yeah, really didn't have a feel for what he was writing for yet. I mean, even, even if it wasn't science fiction, you got to go with Cold War mentality. Like, we knew what was going on in Russia. Like, you're going to tell me that nobody knows what's going on over there. Um, also, what happened in um, in uh, in Act 3 that wasn't covered, because I'm assuming you read the whole thing, um, yes. was the fact that uh, Clemens wanted to get something to take the edge oh, off yeah. in the morning and in the evening, and Beverly was not having any of that. It says, you're fine, and he's like, that's all right. I'll you find have no medical else. need. Yeah, you have no medical needs. That's that's okay. I'll find something else to get. You're a quite attractive looking doctor, and he pats her right on the ass. No, he actually he said I remember because I just watched it. He said you're the pretty little you're the pretty prettiest little doctor I've ever seen. He gave her a fucking double tap on the ass. Yeah, and then she's like much obliged <laughs> after he left. I'm surprised she didn't was like what the fuck. You see him do like a, a yard judo chop on him or something like that. Yeah. Um, and also there was that scene between Clement and um, and uh, Data in his quarters where he was like wanting something to do because he was going stir crazy. And he's like, you know, and, and he's the only one that had any sense that there is stuff greater than ourselves, than himself. And he was like, you know, and he said this line that I thought was cool. He goes, no, I get it. You know, you guys got something big going on. It's it's the same dance, but a different tune. Right. And I was like, and then he said, because they, because they, because he wanted, he told Data he wanted to throw a little potty because he was bored. Right. And then at the end, um, uh, I think Data said the Romulan Star Empire or something. And then he says, well, we won't be inviting these Romulans to our party, will we? And Data's like, no, that wouldn't be appropriate. Right. So you could. The, the funny thing is, is he's he's purported as the dumbest of the group, but he's the one with the most clarity. Oh yeah, because he knows who he is. Right. Like he's not he's not trying to prove anything to anybody. Yeah, he's not trying to prove anything to anybody, but also he, instead of talking, he's listening and he's noticing. Exactly. He's observing, exactly. and that's what that's more of what the creative people tend to do is that they tend to talk less, but they tend to watch more. Pay attention. Yeah. They'll they'll joke around a lot, but they're right. paying attention to what everyone's talking about. Yeah. And and the counter that too in in the same act was Offenhouse after he was done yelling uh, at Bacad like a fucking child. Bacad you know goes and comforts the crying woman because it's the eighties and we gotta right. have a woman crying. Right. Um. He he gave a sincere apology and said, you know, this is just the first time <laughs> in my life where I I have no power over anything. Like I I feel like I'm out of control right. and out of touch is what he said. And and Picard was like, "That's the first thing you said that I I understand, you know, because that makes sense. Yeah. Like he's used to he's used to having ultimate dominion over his life, and all of a sudden now he's just sit here and wait until we're done, right? Yeah, and he don't play that shit. Of course, he doesn't heed his own fucking words and starts yeah. acting like a jackass again. Yeah. Act four. It was a momentary lapse in judgment. Then he went back to his normal self. Right. Act four. We got a captain's log in this one. Captain's log supplemental." We have arrived at the edge of the neutral zone where we will now have an opportunity to learn firsthand what happened to our distant outposts. Um, when they, so just for clarification, because it, it was kind of had, they didn't really say it explicitly, but the Federation or the Enterprise has not crossed the neutral zone. They're, they're right next to it, right? basically. So I just want to, that makes sense later. I just want to make sure we're all aware. When the Enterprise-D arrives at the edge of the neutral zone, they find that a number of outposts have been completely obliterated. Um, there is no evidence of conventional weapons or, or attack. Meanwhile, actually, what was it? I think it was Worf who said it looked like somebody took a hand and just scooped them off the planet. Right. Like a cra some crazy kind of weapon. Meanwhile, Offenhouse notices the tension level on the ship has jumped up and decides that he must take matters into his own hands. Which was funny. Has, be, which was funny because, like, when they initiate the L alert, I didn't see anybody moving any faster. 
Nah, they were like, whatever. It's just yellow. Like, it's, they sound like red Friday. alert. They it's Friday. Like, it's like 5.50 on a Friday. We're ready to <laughs> Motherfucker, get. that ain't the yellow winter. That's the turn up <laughs> alarm. We're about to... <laughs> like, dude. Well, the funny thing, too, is often houses run and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get things done. It's like, dude, you're 400 years in the future on a spaceship. Right. You have no – there's nothing you can do to help right now. He actually did help, I guess. But, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> he heads out to look for the captain. Uh, and he, he get, I remember he got in a turbo lift and he's like, it was a little funny thing. He's like, where would the captain be? Yeah, and then the computer Captain says, McCart- that captain Captain is, is main, um, located on the main bridge. And he's like, take me, take me to the main bridge. <laughs> yeah. Um, a Romulan, uh, did Der- how do you even say that? Deridex. I'm going to say Deridex. Why not? Deridex work. class vessel appears in front of the Enterprise D. Uh, before, well, before that, Memory Alpha, um, <laughs> they were looking for it, playing a bit of a cat and mouse game because they, um, because like they were, they were, the, they were, they were, uh, they were sensing disturbances, like they were kind of cloaking and not cloaking, like and seeing it, what the the and um, Captain, Col- and, well, Captain called him on it too because right. he said they're trying to see, and it, this goes back to, and I have to give her credit, this goes back to what Troy said. Nah. do that, something crazy yeah yes they're trying to get the captain to do something crazy yeah you know so he doesn't take the bait so um Picard recuses to fire on it as it decloaks which Riker and Worf were like this is our only chance we can fire on it when it um decloaks because the shield's not up and he's like fuck off I think he just said no yeah. which was funny he went no and they just were like mm. yeah <laughs> like scolding off- him like wrapping up a newspaper and tapping him on the nose right. like no Offenhouse appears on the bridge just at this moment and is ordered off by Riker. Um, but the security officers are distracted by the Romulans and fail to remove it. And it was so obvious that they just kind of grabbed him, looked at each other, and shook him a little bit yeah. until the next line. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you guys suck. <laughs> um, moving on to Act 5. The Romulan ship responds to the Enterprise-D hailing them. And the Romulans reveal that their outposts have been destroyed in the same manner as the Federation. Uh, Picard a- asks who was responsible, and the Romulans fall si- silent. Offenhouse interjects, they haven't got a clue. They're hoping you know, but they're too arrogant to ask. Right. Which he's correct. Um, Picard proposes an agreement of cooperation as both sides investigate the disappearance of the outposts. I like, I like this part where he's like, an alliance. No, nothing so grandiose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the Romulans agree before heading back toward their territory. They didn't agree, though. They were like, we'll agree if it's convenient. Yeah. You know, they're, they're such dicks, dude. Oh, yeah. Like, but it's the that's just how the Romulans are. They have this... Um, but they're also part Vulcan, which is where that arrogance comes from. Right. They have this superiority complex. The Vulcans have it, too. Yeah. The Vulcans just aren't so aggressive. Right. You know, so it's, it's whatever. But... Um, I also want to mention um, the the, mention. the Romulan on the right has the weirdest voice. Well, he's um, what was his? Um, he was in one of the other episodes um, of Star Trek. He, he's he's done um, with and without the mask. You know, um, I can't remember which one it was, but I know he's been in. Um, he was a uh, Riker's uh, commanding officer. Can't remember which episode that was. I mean that's fine. He just but he had he has a very deep, uh, yeah, very yeah. Kind of deep kind of re re voice. Yeah, I think it's I think it was more it was more prevalent because he was with that other dude who plays um, in Deep Space Nine. Yeah, and he has a very sing songy kind of voice. So their voices were on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so it gave this weird dynamic when right. they were talking. What, um, what almost I, good back. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. And this was the part where, you know, Worf gave kind of his backstory with the Romulans. And um, when the Romulans are discussing, you know, their stuff and, you know, and then Worf says, um, oh, what did Worf say? Um, he said something to the effect that I can't remember what he said, but then the Romulans silence your dog. Yeah, real quick. I was like, damn. It's, it was it was it was a really good scene, and and this little summary doesn't uh, do it justice. Um, so I head back to the own territory with uh, Tabak stating to Picard that the Romulans quote 
are back. back. Yeah. Um, Offenhouse is finally removed from the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deanna Troy helps Claire locate one of her living descendants. And Bacad makes arrangements for the three humans to be... Why do they keep saying three humans? To be returned to Earth on the USS Charleston at the nearest star base. At warp eight, they can make it there in five days. Riker says that it is a shame they can't take the three with them. <laughs> it's like a visit from the past. Picard tells him that would be a step backward yeah. when they still have so much to do and learn. That's not what he said. No, he's Picard not. tells him in that, the wrong direction. Yeah. He says that would be going backward. Yeah, that's what he said. It reminded me of a quote that I heard from that show, The Vikings, mm-hmm. where it said, um, don't look don't look backwards. You're not going that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I like quotes like that. Yeah, or like the, um, you don't have eyes in the back of your head because you don't need to see where you've been. Right. Yeah. Just need to see where you're going. Onward and upward. Even says the Enterprise D continues onward. And, uh-huh. and because there is no relative, you know, direction in space, you can't say upward or downward or anything. You just yeah, you can't say forward or anything. Yeah. Just, they're moving. You yeah. know, they ain't going. <laughs> they're not going to Earth. Is basically what we're trying to say. <laughs> that is the end of season one. Fucking hey, dude. Um, I definitely real quick <coughs> forget what the first it, episode. When I was thinking about this yesterday, now we've finally hit the end of season one. And I was like, God, it took us such a long time. But I forgot that when we first did this, um, for the first several months, we were doing one episode a month. Right. And then in October of last year, we started doing two a month. And then we got through it faster. And if if everything holds, like if everything holds the way it does and we don't miss any episodes, um, in 2017, we should get through the entire second season in that year. Yeah. Give or take. But we most likely will miss a few episodes, so, you know, we'll see how we fix that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next episode to start off season one is a Troy episode. Well, actually, no. Our next episode on our show will be an aberration. We'll oh, be- yeah, because we're going to do the um, the Enterprise one. Yeah, we're going to do Enterprise. Um, uh, these are the voyages. These are the voyages. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Which is a TNG infused episode which i still don't the understand last why. episode the last episode of enterprise um which plays out as a holodeck recreation right. that riker is running right a very old riker is running yeah which is um, a very very big dis- discrepancy between the way riker and troy looks in that episode versus the episode that they're actually you know trying to right. incorporate it in which makes no sense to me but we'll talk about that next time but then when we come back in 2017 after our break, it will be a Troy episode and the introduction of Pulaski. Child. This is the one where she's pregnant. She yeah. also has curly hair. Yeah. Oh. And in this and this one will be the um uh what is it? I think Is this we... the first one with um with Whoopi Goldberg too, isn't it? I think she shows up yeah in there. She is in that episode. There, I don't think she was in it any is episode a, It is a rewritten episode because this yeah, was during the Riker Strike, which is yeah, from phase two when it was gonna yeah. be Shatner and crew coming back and Lieutenant Ilea, who was in the motion picture, was supposed to be impregnated by an alien. Uh, otherwise known as I like I like um I like Guinan. It's one of my favorite characters. She's so fucking dope. I don't know. I just I liked Whoopi Goldberg back in the day. She's gotten a little weird now, but yeah. I well, liked her back in the day. It was funny because I got sick just before my Thanksgiving break. So I was off for five days and I was sick the entire time. Sucked. So like my brother had to work Thanksgiving Day, so I was home in bed, just like you know, like this Thanksgiving sucks. So we um because he had to work Thanksgiving Day, we had Thanksgiving the day before, which still kinda sucked because I wasn't feeling well. But I ended up watching um, Star Trek Generations because for some reason, after watching like all these episodes, I was like, I want to watch Generations again. It's a good movie. It's it, just kind of it's kind of weird. Um, it's a good movie. I think the, the the thing is is that once you get out of the old Enterprise, you know, and you you start the next generation story. It is a good age story, which yeah. I think Star Trek always does well when they talk about time and mortality and all of that. I think because like Star Trek 2, 
dealt with that really well. Um, and, and generations, I think dealt with that as well. And I, I think generations kind of gets the short, short changed a little bit because too many people focus on data and the memory chip and stuff like right. that. Um, but, uh, you know, it was actually a good movie. And to me, there's an emotional string to it because, um, a year before that movie came out, I lost my mom. I lost my mom to cancer and she would only watch the original Star Trek. She did not like Picard. She did not like the next generation. Um, she was like Captain Kirk. No, it is, you know, Captain Kirk is it. And, um, a year after she had passed, um, in generations, I, my brother and I were watching it and, you know, Picard and Kirk is like, you know, wanting to fix the life that he, he messed up. And he goes, and I'm going to marry her. And then he says her name, which is my mom's name, Antonio. Oh, shit. And I was like, oh, my God. My mom would have just, like, fucking, her head would have exploded. Like, it was one of those. And it was just, like, literally a year after my mom died. And then hearing that, it still kind of, like, when I watch it, it still kind of gets me a little choked up. And it seems may seem stupid to, to some people, but, you know, it's like, it's just one of those. It's like when you hear that song, you know. No, that's not stupid, man. That's dope. You, you know, know it's so. that you have a, a real connection to it. You so, know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, and it's just one of those things that was just like, uh, that gets me. And then the other thing that gets me on the geek side is seeing the saucer section crash. Yeah, that, that was shit, dope. That now, now, I can, now I can say stupid shit and not feel bad. Right. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that saucer shit. That whole thing was tense as fuck. Uh, and the cool thing is because is I was watching it again is like there's no music. Like, yeah, there's, there's, that was a really good choice. Yeah, no music, was, no music, and it was just the rattling of the hall, and you know things it was falling. Too, and, it was, it was a, uh, and then you see them sitting there waiting for it to end, and you know, and then just, it really was the end of an era. You yeah. know what I mean? When that ship broke too. Yeah, it was. A, I remember watching that movie, and I was, I was like a preteen, I think. I don't remember when that movie came out, and um, I was genuinely, genuinely sad. Yeah, it was like the Enterprise. <laughs> you spent so many years watching it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like crazy. And and yeah, right. and and watching that end, and then just seeing like when the ship comes to rest, and then everybody slides forward. You know, because right. you're like, oh yeah, inertia. That that's a thing. <laughs> oh yeah, we're not in space anymore. <laughs> yeah, that whole physics thing. Yeah, you know. But but uh, I like that the Enterprise E was slick as shit. Oh though. fuck yeah, dude. Ugh. All right, so I'm, I'm all doing sorts of weird. <laughs> Let's get this outro out the way. <laughs> Even though you've just talked for ten fucking minutes, <laughs> yeah. Um. So you know, same as always, gents and ladies, we want to hear what you have to say. If you don't have anything to say, figure something out <laughs> and hit us up on one of our many outlets. As before, Steve dies. <laughs> right, please. Uh, definitely our Facebook page, Google Plus, Instagram, Twitter, fucking Snapchats, and the news, baby. You know what I mean? Even um, our email. Even our email. Email. It's all the lazy geeks. La- what's the email? The lazy geeks. geeks. <laughs> the, lazy geeks. geeks. the geeks. The geeks at thelazygeeks.com. You want to you wanna read your little personal thing? All right. You guys can find me on the interwebs. I know I haven't been on much lately, but it's just, you know. You know how it is. On Twitter, you can find me at a middle aged geek. Instagram, middle aged underscore geek, or check out my blog, themiddleagedgeek.com. And I am on Twitter at sapien tlg. Um, I and and I don't post a lot because I'm one of those people that if I don't have anything to say, I'm not just gonna say something. But I am on Twitter every day. <laughs> like I read other people's shit, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so that's it. For this edition of the Away Team, I'm Adam Riley. I'm Stephen Vargas. What do you say? Make, Make it so, up. motherfuckers. Make it so, bitches. <laughs> Captain, we are being hailed. This is Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise. 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 But what could it be? Unknown, sir. Perhaps it is scanning, scanning, scanning. This has been a production of the Lazy Geeks Network. 
available only at thelazygeeks.com. Goodbye.